being with us uh, at the Festival del Libro de Bogotá. Um, and today, um, the festival has proposed us to talk a little bit about the unheeded prayers of science. And um, so I would like to introduce David to the audience. David is an American scientific writer, author of more than 10 books, including the very well known book Spillover, Animal Infections and the Next Human Pandemic, Contagio in Spanish. Uh, this book has been, has been named as a predictor of the current pandemic, but more than that, it has been a warning for, for any pandemic of our times. So I would like to start by that, with that, David. So what is exactly a, a spillover? Spillover. Spillover is the English term for the moment when an infectious agent a virus, a bacterium, or something like that passes from one species of host into another. Um, in the cases that we're concerned with, it passes from a non-human animal into a human. Infectious agents such as viruses that, uh, that pass from non-human animals into humans are called zoonoses, and the diseases they call the zoonotic diseases. So spillover is when a zoonosis passes from a species of bat, a species of rodent, a species of monkey into its very first human victim and takes hold and causes infection that might then be passed from human to human and lead to an outbreak, an epidemic or a pandemic. It all begins with spillover. Great. So it's, it's, it's really fascinating how a writer uh, who, who is not initially a scientist is, is speaking about all these scientific terms, um, So which makes you a very special writer. So I am curious to know, David, about uh, how did all this start? Uh, how did you become interested in science, in ecology, in evolutionary biology? How has been your journey to become a scientific writer? Okay, well, it's been a long and winding journey for me. I published my first book more than 50 years ago um, in 1970, and it was a novel. As a young person, I was always interested in, in biology, in nature, and also in writing. And when I began my writing career, I began as a fiction writer. I began as a novelist. And I had not studied much biology in university. I did my graduate work in literature in England. And I published a few novels, and then I discovered that I would rather write nonfiction. I felt like I had more to offer, and also, frankly, it would be easier for me to make a living, I discovered, writing nonfiction. So I started writing nonfiction for magazines, started writing about nature, natural history essays, also started writing about science. I read Darwin, I read evolutionary biology. I taught myself, or I, I learned by reading rather than by academic work, evolutionary biology and ecology, and continued writing about that for magazines and then in books, in, in extended books, um, that were more ambitious, including one that I published in 1996 called The Song of the Dodo. And it's about evolution and extinction and what we have learned about evolution and extinction from the study of islands. And then I wrote more books about ecology and evolutionary biology until the point about 20 years ago when I got very interested in Ebola virus and the mystery of Ebola virus emerging from some species of animal and causing this terrible disease in humans. And the fact that we still did not know at that time which animal Ebola virus lives in when it's not infecting humans. We call that its reservoir host. And the mystery of the reservoir host of Ebola was unsolved. I got interested in that question when I realized that this also was a matter of ecology and evolutionary biology. It was the ecology and evolutionary biology of dangerous viruses. 
And that 20 years ago was the beginning of the journey that led me to write the book Spillover, Contagio, uh, and it has me continuing to work on the subject of, of the COVID-19 virus now. It's the ecology and evolutionary biology of viruses that I have tried to help people understand. Fantastic. And um, David, um, you have been in, in so many different places around the world trying to um, understand this, these epidemics. You've, you've been to Australia, Asia, Africa. And um, so you have experienced by first, first hand, what does it mean to be like a virus detective? Uh, you have interviewed people, you have experienced uh, uh, the job of scientist. So what does it mean to be a virus detective? And what would like, I would like to know what, what you value the most about these experiences. Yes, yes. Well, yes, Volma, it's, it's been a great privilege um, for me to be able to follow these disease scientists around in the field, some very, very brilliant, courageous men and women who do this work. And as you say, they are the, they are the disease detectives or the virus detectives. Now I mentioned the mystery of the reservoir host of Ebola. Every time there is a spillover that leads to an outbreak of a new disease, suddenly people are dying in Malaysia or in Australia or in uh, Bolivia as with Bolivian hemorrhagic fever in 1960 and 1961, a new virus suddenly in humans killing people. That's a mystery that has to be solved. Where did that virus come from if it's new to humans? It had to come from a wild animal, possibly through domestic animals. How did that happen? This is the ecology of dangerous viruses, where they live, and how they pass from one species of host into another. Um, but it's, it's not just ecological science, it's a mystery that has to be solved. So these courageous scientists go into the field, they talk to people, they interview people who have become sick, they trace patterns, that's your profession, epidemiologist. And they also capture animals and look for viruses in the animals that will match the viruses that they're finding in humans. And that's the search for the reservoir host, finding out which animal the new virus came from, how it spilled over from that virus into humans. That's the mystery that these disease detectives attempt to, to solve. And so I've had the opportunity to, to meet those people and follow them around in the field as they do their work. And uh, it's fascinating, it's dramatic, it's uh, somewhat dangerous for them, but they are very cautious and they take precautions. And I have followed them and um, I love life. I don't like unnecessary risks. So I've always made a point of standing about four feet behind them and taking whatever precautions they take. If they wear, if they wear a, a hazmat suit and goggles and gloves, then I wear a suit and goggles and gloves and I stand four feet behind them and I try to stay away from the teeth, the claws and the needles of the work that they're doing. And I have my little notebook and I'm taking notes. Fantastic. I've been, I've been myself in, to those trips uh, at the border between Colombia and Panama uh, helping as well some friends, scientists, finding these viruses that are hidden within the jungle. Uh, Which so virus? Which virus were you? Alpha looking? viruses. Alpha, alpha virus. virus. Yeah. yeah, such as uh, um, in equine encephalitis, uh, Toga viruses as well, Mayaro virus, Una virus, all those that seem to produce as well sometimes uh, small epidemics and then go away and from time to time uh, appear once more, but we don't know much about them. Yes, it's such important work <clears throat> and, uh, and such difficult work, but for the people that do it, you and your friends, I know it is very, um, it's very satisfying 
because it is important. It is indeed. And um, one thing you have mentioned um, in your book um, is about um, uh, viruses are, 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 are entities looking for opportunities to persist, right? Right. Uh, but some people tend to think that pathogens adapt themselves to become less pathogen, less pathogenic in order to survive within the host. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean it always viruses evolve in such a way, right? So That's how right. does evolution, evolutionary theory help us understand the, the the how viruses uh, behave and 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 the current pandemic and how it is evolving yes well thank you for asking that i'm very interested in that question it's very important and it's not well understood by most people because it hasn't been explained i think properly um, first of all um, viruses uh, viruses are these very simple genetic parasites some people argue about whether or not they are even alive. A virus is just a little protein capsule containing a genome, containing genetic information in the form of either DNA, the famous double helix molecule, or RNA, which is a single strand molecule also containing genetic information. So a virus infects cells. A virus is not a cell but it can only replicate itself if it is inside the cells of a cellular creature. We, we humans, we animals are composed of cells, plants are composed of cells, fungi are composed of cells, viruses are not cells, they can only replicate inside cells using cell machinery. So they don't have purposes. They don't wish us ill. They're not trying to kill us. They're not trying to jump from animals into humans. But because they have a genome and they replicate using a genome, genetic material, they are subject to what I call the three Darwinian imperatives after Charles Darwin. All creatures that replicate with genomes are subject to these three Darwinian imperatives. First imperative, make as many copies of yourself as you can. Have babies produce offspring, multiply abundantly. Second imperative, extend yourself, expand yourself throughout geographical space, colonize habitat wherever you can. Third, extend yourself in time, avoid extinction survive, make sure that your population survives. So those are the three Darwinian imperatives. Make copies of yourself, expand yourself in geographical space. And if you do those two things, making lots of copies of yourself and expanding yourself in geographical space, then you will achieve the third imperative, which is avoiding extinction, extending yourself in time. So that's what viruses do. Now, when a virus jumps from a species of say an, an endangered species of bat into humans, it does that doesn't actually jump. Uh, it spills, and that's why I say spillover. Um, viruses can't walk, they can't run, they can't swim, they can't fly. They ride, and they tumble from one host into another. And if they happen to tumble into a new species of host, and they find that they can replicate themselves abundantly, then they have succeeded in expanding themselves in geographical space. They have colonized new habitat, a new kind of creature. And if they go for an, from an endangered species of bat by accident and get into humans and then can transmit from human to human, they have by accident achieved a great increase in their success because we have 8 billion humans around the world everywhere. And so that now they have access to all this new habitat. Will they become, and, and frequently when they, when they get into humans, they cause disease. Um, they cause people to be sick. Maybe they cause people to sneeze or to bleed or to have diarrhea. And by doing those things, it helps them to transmit from one human to another. If they pass through the air or they pass through blood or they pass through water from one human to another, 
and that's how they expand themselves in geographical space. Sometimes they cause terrible disease. Sometimes they kill people. Is it their purpose to do that? No. They get, they get no evolutionary success from killing people. And they, so, um, so the killing of people is a side effect of their obeying the Darwinian imperatives, trying to succeed. If they can pass from human to human without killing people, they will. Does that mean a virus always evolves to be less virulent, to be less severe in humans once it's in there? Some people say that, some people think that, as you said, but no, not necessarily so. For instance, SARS-CoV-2, the COVID-19 virus, it transmits very well. It makes uh, some people very sick. It kills maybe one person in a hundred. That is a side effect of its transmission. Now that it's in humans and it's passing around the world, is it going to become less severe, less pathogenic and become like a common cold? Not necessarily so, because that 1%, it neither prevents it from achieving transmission nor allows it to achieve better transmission. So there's no particular reason why this virus will evolve to be less virulent as long as it is succeeding in transmitting from human to human as well as it is. And in fact, now that we have vaccines, there is a chance that the virus will evolve to escape the vaccines and we will have to deal with that. Virus is always mutating, it's always changing randomly um, and that is not evolution. Evolution is when it becomes adapted in new ways and that occurs when it encounters challenges and then succeeds by Darwinian natural selection in evading those challenges. And vaccines are a form of challenge that the virus can potentially evade by natural selection. I hope that's not too much information, not too confusing, um, but that's the no, answer. Yeah, I think it's great. And it's, it's, it's good to people to know that, uh, that those evolutionary imperatives are always determining how how viruses yes. can can evolve within and 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 uh, within this pandemic uh, you were speaking a little bit about vaccines and uh, i would like to take from that point for my next question to you um it's been great that in less than a year we have already a vaccine or even many many candidates and around 10 vaccines approved around the world for emergency use. However, we've seen as well in the world uh, this behavior of uh, rich countries getting uh, higher proportions of their populations already vaccinated and thinking about third doses and um, boosters, whereas uh, many, many countries in the global south um, are less than 10% of their population vaccinated. So I would like to ask you about your view on how, how important and how, and what, what, what do you think about this vaccine inequality and what we can do about it? Yes, vaccine inequality, vaccine inequity is the single most important problem of the second year of the COVID pandemic. It is absolutely the most important problem that we're facing now, vaccine inequity. Um, now we, we're fortunate, as you said, we have vaccines, different countries around the world have produced vaccines, um, China, Russia, the US, Great Britain, um, and, and other scientists in other countries. Um, but now we need to get those vaccines to people in every country. Uh, vaccines should not be allocated uh, according to wealth. 
this planet, the human population of this planet is not safe from COVID until everybody is safe. Um, and so we need, um, we need manufacturing capacity desperately to produce more doses of these viruses. And we need cooperation among nations to get those vaccines distributed irrespective of politics and economics. This is a matter of health and evolution. Now, how we do that, I'm not a policy person. I'm not a political leader. I, I'm not an economist. I don't know how you, how you do that, how you solve the problems of getting more manufacturing capacity and distribution of these vaccines. Um, some countries, China, and now the US, um, among others, have improved their efforts to get vaccines to other countries. We, we did horribly, we in the US did horribly during, um, during the year 2020 in dealing with the pandemic ourselves and in preparing um, to produce enough vaccines to be helpful to other countries. Um, we had a we had a terrible leader. I can't I can't remember his name right now, but we had a terrible president. Um, and we uh, we have a much better situation now, and we are trying. We know this is important. We know that that fairness and health around the world requires vaccine equity. It needs to be worked on, and um, and and I hope it will be. Great. We all hope. Um, David, um, I have the, the feeling that humanity in general and politicians in some sense before this pandemic were thinking um, on uh, infectious diseases are, as, a, as, a store, as a history of uh, our past history and somehow society is getting more developed uh, and, and less prone to infectious diseases. And, and, and then somehow these exotic pathogens were perhaps the concern of only a few scientists or very specialized agencies. However, with COVID-19, now the population is aware this is a real threat to, yes. to our contemporary world. And, um, and, uh, but still, we are not yet prepared in case we may face a similar challenge in the future. So in your view, um, do you consider uh, this pandemic will be a breaking point to regarding being more willing to preparedness and how societies will, will be deciding about this? Yeah, well, Volmo, you mentioned um, the historical dimension. And yes, there's a long history of humans suffering pandemics. You know, the Black Death of the 14th century killed what? Maybe a third of the population of Europe. And that was a zoonotic disease. That was a bacterium that passed from, from rats to people carried in, um, in fleas. That, that were on the bodies of rats. So the fleas would jump off the rat and get into a get onto a human and bite the human and 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 spread bubonic plague. It was a bacterium. Um, in the 20th century, we had the wonderful development of antibiotics, which can can fight bacterial diseases. And so for most of the 20th century, we had this great relief from from pandemics caused by bacterial diseases. Now we have two problems. One is that we've used antibiotics so much that there is resistance evolving in bacteria um, so that they're not susceptible to antibiotics anymore, some dangerous strains of bacteria. But even more famously, we have the rise of viral diseases. And some people don't realize this, but viruses don't care about antibiotics. Antibiotics have no effect on viruses. Uh, so we have viral pandemics beginning in the 20th century with the 1918 influenza, which killed perhaps 50 million people around the world. Um, and uh, then we started developing vaccines. Vaccines do work. 
against viruses. So we've got vaccinations that helped us control some of the old familiar viruses, the yellow fever virus, we can vaccinate against the yellow fever virus. Smallpox, we could vaccinate. Polio, we could vaccinate. But now those problems seem like they're in the past, but they're not in the past because there are a, a stunning diversity of new viruses that continue to live in wild animals around the world, particularly in richly diverse ecosystems like tropical forests. Tropical forests are filled with richly diverse species of animals, all of which carry their own viruses. And some of those viruses are capable of getting into humans. So now, as there is more and more contact between humans and wild animals, as we are, we are taking resources out of diverse ecosystems, we're we're cutting down trees and we're, we're killing animals for food and we're, we're pasturing our livestock in places that used to be forests. Those are giving opportunities for new viruses to get into humans. And when they get into humans, there is something about the modern era that contributes to the risk of pandemic. And that is our interconnectedness the size of our population and the interconnectedness. People are flying everywhere. People are living in dense cities close to one another. People are bringing wildlife into those dense cities in some cases for food. Viruses are being passed into people, spreading and traveling around the world uh, the way COVID-19's virus, SARS-CoV-2 has done. So now we have this terrible pandemic Back to your point, will it be a break point in our understanding of this problem? The, our understanding that this is, not, this is not a matter of the past, not a matter of history, this is now. We face a greater danger of pandemic disease spreading around the world than we ever have. Will people recognize that? Well, Volmo, that's one of the questions I've been asking the 85 scientists that I have interviewed in the last six months um, for their views on. Will this pandemic have been bad enough that people will recognize what caused it, what makes us vulnerable to pandemic, what we have to do to prepare ourselves against the next one? And all I can say is that I am hopeful that it will be a break point, that we will realize the extent of our own responsibility, individual responsibility and collective responsibility for causing pandemics and allowing them to spread. Everything we do as individuals, the choices that we make has impact on this problem because it has impact on our footprint on the natural world, our impact on the natural world. So how much we travel, what we, what we buy, what we eat, how much energy we concern, consume, how many children we have, if we have children, all of those decisions have impact on the natural world. And that impact brings viruses closer to us. And our collective decisions, our decisions on government um, also have huge impact on this. So I hope that this terrible event, COVID-19, um, will lead people to think about that and to realize our collective role in this and our individual roles in this and, and act in radically different ways going forward. I hope, I hope. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, me too, me too. Probably, um, yeah, yeah, you have mentioned um, a little bit about this relationship between our collective and individual actions mm -hmm. and, um, and the role of uh, biodiversity, climate change, and how interconnected they are as well with uh, the possibilities of a pandemic. And uh, so I would like to for you to expand a little bit more about this relationship between culture 
environment uh, and, uh, and pathogens? Well, um, people need to eat. People have children. Um, and therefore, the human population is still increasing, nearly 8 billion, and it's still increasing. And equally important, our consumption is high. Our average consumption is high. Now, this is another question of fairness and, and equity and, and inequality of, of, of opportunity and resources. Um, some people say, well, the human population, uh, it's continuing to grow and that's a problem. So those people in Africa shouldn't have six babies. Well, those six babies that a family has in a village in Africa, those six children are going to consume less resources in their lifetimes, un unfortunately for them, than the average person living in a developed country in the West. It's not just population, it's population multiplied by consumption. So even if we're people who have only a few children or no children, we still need to recognize that the scale of our consumption is much higher than some very disadvantaged people who might live, you know, in in a, a forest edge area um, in the tropics and not have the opportunity to consume very much in the way of resources. So again, it's a matter of fairness. It's a matter of population size and consumption, and we have to think about both of those things because those things together represent our impact on the natural world. Population size multiplied by consumption. Um, we can all live good lives if we stabilize our population size and if we move toward decreasing the inequities of consumption. The gap between rich and poor. The gap between rich and poor is probably the most severe public health problem we have on this planet, as well as the, the most severe justice problem. Yeah. Um, in, in, in your book as well, you, you have mentioned um, uh, about this relationship between animals and and humans mm -hmm. i i really love really 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 like the the way you you are able to approach to as well to how animals are, are suffering as well sometimes for due to these diseases and their populations around and and this relationship between animals and humans and um in latin america we we still have as well as as you have described for for africa for example bush meat and this type of uh, hunting and eating wild animals in 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 latin america is more much more common for example armadillos opos, opossums some primates uh, many species of rodents bats even um in you in your book you have described a particular case in the in, in bolivia the mapucho virus and uh, however for some for some reasons uh, we are more used to 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 see like epidemics or outbreaks or big outbreaks rising from africa either africa or asia uh, but as well in the tropics in Latin America, we, we, we have a potential for that. So I would like to, to know your view on uh, where should we focus our attention in terms of potential sources for new outbreaks? Yeah, yes, well, um, a good question. And, and you mentioned the book, I talk about Mapuche virus in the book. Uh, I know this is a book festival, so I, I probably should say a bit about the book. The book is, there's a lot of travel in the book. Um, there's these detective stories, these disease detective stories. There are these courageous characters, um, men and women who, who go to these places, difficult places, and walk in the jungle. And I tell the stories and I follow them through the jungle, whether they're darting, darting gorillas in, in Central Africa to look for Ebola virus or 
um, trapping bats in Bangladesh. I described working with a scientist, following a scientist on a rooftop in Bangladesh in the middle of the night, who's trapping giant fruit bats looking for Nipah virus. And I tell a little bit the story of Mapucho virus. Um, Mapucho um, was a virus that emerged in Bolivia in 1960, 1961 in certain villages and started causing a dreadful disease. And there was a disease scientist who went there named Carl Johnson, a young virologist and, and medical doctor from the Centers for Disease Control who went there and led a team and they tried to solve the mystery. And they figured out that this virus was being carried by wild rodents. And because of changes in seasonal changes, changes in rainfall, changes in drought, changes in food supply for the wild rodents, more and more of these wild rodents were coming into villages where villages were growing crops and the rodents were attracted by their crops, probably by corn and I'm not sure what else. And uh, maybe they were storing corn um, and the, the rodents were attracted and the rodents brought this virus with them and they passed it to the people. And so Carl Johnson solved this mystery in the course of which he got infected with M Mapucho virus and nearly died. And he was uh, evacuated to a hospital in Panama and he barely survived this virus. Um, Carl Johnson is now in his 80s. He's a friend of mine. I got to know him 25 years ago because he also was one of the scientists who first studied Ebola virus in, uh, in the Congo in Central Africa. So he was a great hero to me and he's a hero in my book, Carl Johnson. And he is the one who um, led the team working on Mapucho. Now, back to your question, bushmeat. Uh, bushmeat is not something that uh, is just uh, um, a problem for people in Africa. Um, bushmeat is, is any wild animal that is captured and killed for food. It can be done in Bolivia, it can be done in Colombia, it can be done in Montana. Um, we, I am not a hunter, but my friends, I have friends who hunt birds, who hunt deer, who hunt elk for food. And here we don't call it bushmeat, we call it game. Oh, you have wild game, great, you have venison, you have, you killed a deer and we can eat this deer. But it's the same, it's just a different, a different term. We have to recognize that people who live in rural villages with, um, that are adjacent to forests, they need food, they need protein, they're hungry, their children are hungry. So they will eat wild animals anywhere in the world. But it's dangerous. It's dangerous because those wild animals carry viruses. Um, so again, part of dealing with this problem is, is helping people understand, giving them information about the risks, giving them the opportunity to develop alternatives to raise domestic livestock, maybe to raise chickens, to raise rabbits, to raise fish, so that they have alternative sources of protein. And then also take, help them take care that the viruses that live in wild animals aren't passed to their own domestic animals, to their pigs, to their chickens, and then from the domestic animals to them. There is a term that these scientists use, and I'm sure you're familiar with it, and let's tell readers about it. It's called One Health. One Health. There is no animal health here and human health here. There is no wildlife health here and livestock health here and human health here separated. It's all one health. And to keep humans healthy, we have to be aware of the diseases, the, the pathogens that wildlife carry, and the, the fact that they can be picked up by domestic animals too and shared. It's, it's the, the mindset of understanding that there is only one health that allows people, veterinarians, epidemiologists, virologists, medical doctors working together 
ecologists working together to deal with these problems. That's great, David. And uh, another thing I was really amazed in your book is um, uh, be, because I was trained as a mathematical modeler, um, and and in your book I, I was really pleased to 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 read about uh, a bit the history of uh, Ross, uh, McKendrick, uh, more recent, recently Anderson and May, and how how math mathematics came into this world of evolutionary bio biology, and uh, so I would like to know your view on the value and the role of mathematical models to understand epidemics? This is a very interesting question. Now, I am not a mathematician. I'm not a biologist either, but I'm, a, I'm definitely not a mathematician. Um, but I have great respect for the role of mathematics in ecology and evolutionary biology and the role of modeling, creating mathematical models that allow uh, scientists to make predictions about what's going to happen in ecological and evolutionary terms. Um, a mathematical model, um, some, someone intelligent said um, that all mathematical models are wrong, but some are useful. And what that person meant was that when you create a model, um, you, you take certain factors from the real world and you build them in, but you make estimates, you make um, approximations because it's only a model, it's not the real world. If it were the real world, it would be too big and complicated for you to understand. But by creating a model, you simplify things in order to go from point A to point B to point C and then predict where point D might be. It's like a map. It's like having a road map in the glove compartment of your car. It's an approximation, but a road map or a GPS will allow you to drive somewhere and get to your destination without really knowing all of the geography. That's what a road map does. But a road map is an approximation, a simplification. If a road map were, were completely faithful to reality, then a roadmap of Colombia would be as big as Colombia. It would have to be, and you couldn't use it. So you shrink it down so you can put it in your glove compartment by making approximations. That's what a mathematical model, at least in my understanding, does. So then you can take the mathematical model and you can say, well, uh, this disease seems to have a transmission rate of this amount and a fatality rate of this amount and the population density of this city is this amount. Let's put those factors together and we'll turn the crank on the model and it will give us a prediction of how bad this pandemic is going to be in a particular city or how quickly it may spread through a particular city. And that's hugely valuable. And so some of the people that you mentioned who are in my book, I tell the story, Ronald Ross involved with malaria in the early 20th century and Cormac and McKendrick, two uh, scientists who devised some, some simplified models for understanding disease and then Roy Anderson and Robert May in England, who did a great, great service in mathem mathematizing infectious disease and others. These people are the mathematical heroes of, of the understanding of how diseases function in the ecological and evolutionary world. Yeah, I, I, I was really pleased to to see their names there. And um, it brings uh, another question to you as well about um, this, uh, the word of infectious diseases is, is, is a bit complicated to, to explain. Um, sometimes is um, counterintuitive. Um, 
and um, and you and you do it greatly in your book using a language that people can understand and terms of and giving giving characters uh, information for us to follow as as a, as a novel and uh, so so my question to you is is about uh, what we can learn as scientists from from literature from writers in terms of facilitating communication between science and 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 the society yes well um it's interesting i've i've sometimes been asked that to talk to scientists about that how how do you communicate science to ordinary people non-scientists um and one of the things and that's my job my job is and, and and others who who occupy the same space as I do, we're between you scientists and the general public, the people who aren't scientists but who sometimes want to read a book about science. The first point is that people want to read about people. So when you write about science, I believe it's important to write about the people who do science. They are humans as well. Tell their stories. Tell the human story of science. You know, science is not a body of fact. Science is a process of discovery. It's a method of learning. Science involves some, some basic principles like hypothesis testing, gathering of empirical data, et cetera, et cetera. Science also involves ambition, competition, friendship um uh, inequities um unequal access to opportunities for instance women um have had to had to fight very hard to get the same opportunities in science as men have had now that is you know that has improved very much but it needs much more improvement science is about all these things it's about these human factors so if you tell those stories as you write about science you make it more human you make it more dramatic you make it more personal for people you make it more interesting you make it suspenseful um, sometimes you can make it funny sometimes you can make it sad i believe that when you write a book a nonfiction book um you should you should have the skills um to make people cry to make people laugh to make people surprised to make people see the world in a new way and to make people want to turn the page to find out what's going to happen next so whether you're writing about crime and a in a detective story or you're writing about science and a great problem and in the discovery that solves that problem you keep those things in mind you tell human stories about about searching and struggling and discovering and and being human that's fantastic and that's what i love the most about your book david thank you Puma. <laughs> and um I'm going back a little bit to to outbreaks, and um, so one thing that uh, that uh, people may may think sometimes is that these events occur, which they may occur in in a in a way totally random, but at the same time they are related between them, and we are seeing like an increase um, trend in, in in the appearance of outbreaks. So can you tell us a little bit about what does it mean in terms of our current and contemporary world? And uh, are we going to see more and more outbreaks as, as we progress? Well, um, yes, these things are not, um, are not unconnected events. Um, they are part of a pattern. And I talk about it in that book, in, the, in Spillover, in Contagio. I talk about what I call the drumbeat of disease emergence events in the last 
60 years. Machupo, we've talked about Machupo virus. I think I, I may have said Mapucho, but Machupo virus. Um, Machupo virus in Bolivia, 1961. Um, Marburg virus coming out of um, Central Africa in the bodies of monkeys and, and getting into humans in Marburg, Germany, 1967. Ebola, 1976. Uh, AIDS, HIV being recognized in 1981, uh, hantavirus in the US, 1992, uh, Hendra virus in Australia, 1994, coming out of bats, getting into horses and then passing from horses into people and killing people. On it goes. Um, bird flu, 1997, um, Nipah virus in Malaysia, 1998. SARS coming out of China, 2003, the original SARS, and then MERS in the Mideast, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, 2012, Zika, 2015, be, being recognized in, in South America. This drumbeat, and now we have COVID-19. These things are all interconnected. They're not random acts that have happened, events that have happened to humans. They're part of a pattern. And as we've already discussed, we humans are, are the driving factors in that, in that pattern. The multiplication of our population, the growth of our population to the point of 8 billion, the scale of our consumption, the disruption of richly diverse ecosystems, giving viruses the opportunity to get into us, to pass from human to human, and then to ride airplanes around the world. It's all one problem. We talk about one health, it's also one problem. It's, it's the problem of the increased likelihood of pandemic disease coming from wild animals and spreading around the world because of things that we humans are doing. We can deal with it, we can, we can cope with this problem, but first of all, we have to recognize it is a single problem and it's caused by things that we do. Thank you, David. I, I think we are we are coming to to the end of our conversation, and I just want to thank you for for this opportunity to talking to you, and uh, and um, and uh, I am not finishing without asking you what are, what are you working on and uh, what are your your plans for future scientific writing. Well. Thank you very much, Volma. And it's been a pleasure to be part of Filbo. I'm 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 honored to be asked, and I just wish I were I, I were able to be with. We were all able to be together in person for this festival. What I'm working on now is a book on COVID-19. I was working on a different book until March of last year, and my publisher asked me, "Would you please set that book aside and give us a book on COVID-19?" Now there will be a lot of books. They're already being published about COVID-19. I've got a stack of them to read here myself. Um, I'm trying to write a book that will be uniquely useful. And I'm, I'm approaching it by doing what I feel comfortable doing, which is writing about the science, the ecology, and the evolutionary biology of a virus, a novel virus. So rather than focusing on the politics, on the public health crises, other books are doing that. That's very important. I'm focusing on the virus itself. I'm going to try and help people understand um, this novel virus that has gotten into humans, uh, its origin, its evolution, and its fierce journey through the human population. Um, so that's what I'm writing about right now. And, I, and, and I've been doing it by Zoom, this wonderful um, tool that we have uh, that has served us well as an alternative to to being together during COVID-19. I have interviewed um, 85 of the world's leading scientists uh, working on this virus over the last six months. And now I'm in the process of, of writing this book. That's fascinating, David. And I think it's a, it's a, there is currently a huge debate about the origins of SARS-CoV-2. And uh, so it will be great to have your, your book out and, Thank and you. see you. I, and I will certainly deal with that question. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much, David, again. And thank you, Philbo, for having us. Thank today. you, Philbo. And thank you, Volma. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. Very best of luck with your important work. Thank you so much, David.